Hi everyone, welcome back to CSC348. So today we're talking about all sorts of stuff, um, but I want to preface this with uh, basically, I'm talking about concepts that, at least for the first part of this video, I'm talking about concepts that apply to all functions in general, not just things like algorithms. So uh, in classes like 202, you would have seen things like big O notation used for specifically programs and stuff like that. That doesn't mean that what I'm about to talk about just uh, just is only applicable to algorithms. Uh, I'm about to talk about big O notation. I'm about to give a very big, uh, a very mathematical uh, definition of it, and this definition can actually be used for really any function as long as that function goes from the real numbers to the real numbers. So, function growth is a really cool. Um, it's a, it's a really cool concept that is applied to a lot of functions outside of just algorithms. If anyone has any uh, any interest in it, I can actually show off some examples where function growth and big O notation is actually used outside of algorithms. So, for example, um, I've seen it used in case in uh, in applications like uh, words sizes of certain subgraphs or things like that. So. It, uh, definitely graph theory, actually. I, I see big O notation used a lot for things that aren't algorithms, so I'm happy to dig up some examples of that if anyone is interested. Uh, definitely talk to me in office hours or in class. But without further ado, let's uh, talk about function growth. So right now, um, we're going to talk about how a function, how a function's output grows as its input grows. So not so much like the slope of a function per se, but more the pattern that its output follows as it changes with regards to its input changing, um, which I guess doesn't may not be the most descriptive. But what I'm basically trying to do is we're trying to model functions and say, well, this function, this function's growth can be seen, uh, it can be comparative, or it can be compared to this other function in terms of its growth. So you can consider us looking at upper bounds, at lower bounds, and so on. So I'll just get into the mathematical dis definition and see if I can't give any good examples here. So I'm going to let f and g be functions from the real numbers to the real numbers. Uh, we say that f of x is o of g of x, big O of g of x. This is the letter O, not the number zero, by the way. If there exists constants c in the positive real numbers and k in the real numbers, such that f of x, the absolute value of f of x is always less than or equal to c times the absolute value of g of x for all x greater than k. And we would say that f of x equals o of g of x, which is another uh, slight abuse of notation. I know we've seen a few of those recently, but it basically says that f of x is equivalent to g of x in terms of uh, sort of upper bound function growth per se. So for example, we can take a look at two functions and I think I've talked about how much I hate um, general, like, you know, using examples as graphs and stuff like that, but I'm going to do it for this one. So let's say we have some kind of linear function like this and some kind of quadratic function that looks like this, right? So let's say this is our f and this is our g. Basically, what we can do is we can say, well, if we let this point be k, then we'll notice that g of x is always greater than f of x, greater than or equal to f of x after our point k. So what we're saying is that after k, in the extreme long run of taking a look at like really, really, really large values of x, um, in the extreme long run, g is going to be an upper bound for f. g will be larger than f at a, uh, after the certain point k. So really what we're concerned about is does a function, um, can we put an upper bound on a function from some certain positive real number up until, you know, forever? So if we're looking at x equals a million, x equals a billion, x equals a trillion, so on and so on and so on and so on, as the x grows larger and larger and larger, can we find nice little upper bounds that uh, describe the function's growth in terms of some function that we are aware of? 
So that's sort of the principle of big O of X, is that we know that there's a function. Uh, we say f of X is equal, or f of X is O of G of X, if at some point G of X, uh, after some value of X, uh, or after some K, basically, G of X uh, multiplied by C is going to be larger than f of x, or I guess greater than or equal to f of x. Uh, so here's some examples. Um, what I have right here are, these are actually some theorems on how we can talk about uh, some f of x being O of g of x. So note that the definition of f of x says that if there exist constants c and k such that this holds true, then f of x is O of g of x. So when we're trying to prove that 4x squared is O of G uh, is O of X squared, we actually get to find a specific constant C and K such that that property holds. So this is an example of doing that. So what we're going to do to show that 4x squared is O of X squared, we're going to consider C equals 4 and K equals 0. And for C equals 4, K equals 0, we're going to show that F of X, the absolute value of F of X is always less than or equal to c times the absolute value of g of x. So what I do is I say consider c equals 4, k equals 0. Since we're only worrying about x greater than k, we know that x is greater than 0, which means that the absolute value of x squared will just equal x squared. Uh, because you won't have any sort of like, you know how uh, the absolute value of negative 1 squared is, well, actually, I guess, yeah, absolute value of x squared will always be x squared, I suppose. But we don't, we don't have to worry about any funky stuff with negatives or anything like that. Basically, we'll, we know that x squared is equal to x, absolute value of x squared is equal to x squared, and the absolute value of 4x squared is equal to 4x squared. Thus, if we take a look at this, uh, the absolute value of 4x squared, uh, which is f, by the way, f, our f of x is going to be 4x squared, and our g is going to be x squared. So the absolute value of f of x, the absolute value of 4x squared is equal to 4x squared by this property here, which is equal to 4 times the absolute value of x squared by this property, which means that the absolute value of f of x, which is this, is equal to c times the absolute value of g of x, like so. And then if they're equal, that means that they're less than or equal. That uh, if this is equal to this, that means that this is less than or equal to this. Uh, just because if they are equal, then it is true that this is less than or equal to that. So when x is greater than k, which equals 0, we know that this is true because of this math here, that the absolute value of 4x squared is equal to 4 times the absolute value of x squared. So the absolute value of 4x squared is less than or equal to 4 times the absolute value of x squared. Because we have this property established, that means that 4x squared is O of x squared. Uh, here's another example right here. Uh, this case, I'm going to show that 9x squared is equal to O of x cubed. And in this case, I'm going to choose slightly different values for k. Uh, c is going to be 9, uh, which kind of, I think, follows a similar train of logic from before. But in this case, I'm choosing k equals 2. And the reason why is that if k was equal to 0, let's say, then um, x squared, let's see, 0 0.5 squared is 0 0.25, wait, uh, yeah, 0 0.5 squared is equal to 0 0.25, but 0 0.5 cubed is equal to 0 0.125. So if for uh, values of k between um, 0 and 1, uh, x squared, sorry, for values of x between 0 and 1, x squared is actually greater than x cubed. So we want to avoid k being 0 because that allows for some funky x values. But for any x greater than 1, uh, x squared will be less than x cubed. And in fact, uh, we're just doing x greater than 2 just to be safe, but when x is greater than 2, x squared will certainly be less than x cubed. So we'll also note that since x is greater than 2, the absolute value of x squared is equal to x squared, and the absolute value of x cubed is actually equal to x cubed. Uh, so this is a, a point where we really need to specify that the absolute value of x cubed is x cubed, 
when x is greater than 2. Because if x was able to be negative, then the absolute value of x cubed would be uh, negative times the uh, x, negative 1 times x cubed. So we do need to mention that x is greater than 2. So we can then say that x cubed, absolute value of x cubed equals x cubed. Now what I do here is I say x squared is certainly less than x cubed because x is less than, is greater than 2. So because of this, and by these two equalities, the absolute value of x squared is certainly less than the absolute value of x cubed, which means that the absolute value of x squared is certainly less than or equal to the absolute value of x cubed. I'll multiply both sides of the inequality by 9 to get 9 times the absolute value of x squared is less than or equal to 9 times the absolute value of x cubed. And then we can actually move this inside because 9 is positive. And then we'll get the absolute value of 9x squared, which is f of x, is less than or equal to 9 times the absolute value of x cubed, which is c times g of x for x greater than k. So because the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to c times the absolute value of g of x for all x greater than k, we know that 9x squared is O of x cubed. All right. Another thing I want to talk about, if I can find my notes. There's my notes. I need to get everything in order. My apologies. Another thing I want to talk about is how we know when n squared, uh, sorry, when a function is not O of another function. So in this case, we're going to show that n squared is not O of n. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to do a proof by contradiction. So supposing that n squared is equal to O of n, then basically if n squared is equal to O of n, there must exist constants c and k such that the absolute value of n squared is less than or equal to c times the absolute value of n for all n greater than k by definition uh, of big O notation. So since we're doing a perfect contradiction, we don't actually know, we don't necessarily know what the C and this K are. We just know that they exist. And we're trying to find a general purpose contradiction for any possible version of C and K that anyone could throw at us. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to note that C, that sorry, that K might be negative. And if k is negative, and we're looking at all x greater than k, well, uh, the uh, sorry, if we're looking at all n greater than k, well, the absolute value of n, if k is negative, might sometimes be negative n. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to note that when n is greater than the maximum between 0 and k, absolute value of n squared is equal to n squared, and absolute value of n is equal to n. The reason why I'm saying max between 0 and k here is that if k is greater than 0, then certainly it holds, because if k is greater than 0, then n is guaranteed to be positive. However, if k is less than 0, then we don't know that this will always be true. However, if k is less than 0, then we're still saying basically by our assumption for the proof by contradiction, if k is less than 0, we're still saying that the absolute value of n squared is less than or equal to c times the absolute value of n for all n greater than k. And if k is less than 0, this would also include all positive n. So because these facts hold true for all positive n, when k is less than 0, then we're going to show that there is a contradiction somewhere in the positive n uh, realm, and somewhere in the realm of the positive n's which means that there is an n greater than k such that something in here goes wrong. So no matter what, we're still going to show that there's a contradiction for some n greater than k in this area. I'm just sort of talking about, I'm just sort of restricting our focus to any, to only the positive n, even if there are some cases where n is allowed to be negative. But we're just, I'm basically just showing that there is a, there exists a contradiction somewhere in the positive n region. So basically, uh, since we can say that when n is positive, when n is a valid positive number, a positive number that is greater than k, 
n squared, absolute value of n squared equals n squared, and the absolute value of n equals n. Then we can say that for all n greater than the maximum of 0 and k, uh, basically by this assumption here, the assumption that we're making for our proof of contradiction, this means that n squared is less than or equal to c times n for all n, for all positive n, such that n is also greater than k. Which means that if we divide both sides by n, n must be less than or equal to c. Now this is a problem because n is allowed to be any real number so long as n is greater than k. But we're also saying that n must be less than c. So there's a contradiction here, and we have two possible values for contradiction. Uh, if c is greater than k, then n equals c plus 1 would be a contradiction. Because uh, n is a real number, c plus 1 is a real number, so n is totally allowed to be c plus 1, and c plus 1 is not less than or equal to c. However, if uh, k is equal to or greater than c, then basically n can be k plus 1, and k plus 1 will be greater than c in that case. And the whole thing still falls apart. Even though k plus 1 is a completely valid reason, uh, even though k plus 1 is a completely valid uh, value, basically, for n to b, um, since n has to be a real number, the fact that we asserted that this boundary has to exist causes a contradiction. So basically, either choosing c plus 1 or k plus 1, depending on how c and k are related to each other, either one of those will contradict the statement. Since c plus 1 and k plus 1 are both real numbers, which means that n is totally allowed to be those, and the maximum between the two is greater than k. So we just choose the largest one that is greater than k and say, okay, well, that's also going to be greater than c. So... Words. It's also going to be greater than c, so that provides our contradiction. So therefore, n cannot actually be, sorry, n squared cannot actually be O of n. So basically, that's a very short introduction to big O notation. We just basically say that big O notation shows when our g of x inside of the O bounds our f of x from above in terms of function growth. So we say that, hey, well, uh, n, in this case, uh, actually words, in the case of this one right here, we'll, we'll basically say that x squared won't grow any faster than x cubed because at some point, uh, sorry, non x squared will not grow any faster than x cubed because at some point, x cubed is going to pass 9x squared and then at that point, at the point where x cubed passes 9x squared, 9x squared will never be bigger than x cubed. So 9x squared is bounded by uh, bounded from above by x cubed. Or 4x squared is uh, bounded from above by x squared because we can multiply x squared by 4 and we get basically an exact match. So it's technically it's bounded from above. Uh, it's bounded because these are uh, 4x squared and x squared. 4x squared and 4x squared are the same function. So 4x squared behaves exactly the same as x squared in terms of how the output grows. Not so much the specifics of what the actual output is, but in terms of how the output grows, that just the trends of how the output grows as we increase our input values. On the other hand, right here, oh, on the other hand, right here, when we're saying that n squared is not O of n, what we're saying is that there is no place, uh, there's basically a place where n squared passes O of n, where O of n can never catch back up. So we can't bound uh, n, sorry, we can't bound n squared by n because eventually n squared will pass up n, and then n can never catch up again. Uh, sort of like what happened here is that this linear function is increasing here, and the quadratic or something like that, the polynomial function here passes the linear function and then never really comes back down again. So the linear function has no hope of catching up again. So that's the brief introduction to big O notation. 
And then for your knowledge, we're not really going to work with it in this class, but for your knowledge, there are two more types of notation, notations. There's big omega notation here, which is practically the same as big O notation, except for the fact that it bounds from below. So in this case, we have that the absolute value of f of x is greater than or equal to c times the absolute value of g of x in order for f of x to be big omega g of x. So if big O is a bound from above, big omega is a bound from below. And then we have big theta notation, which is when f of x is bounded from above and below by g of x. So we say that if f of x is O of g of x and omega g of x, that f of x is theta g of x. And if we say that f of x is theta g of x, then we can know that f of x and g of x uh, basically exhibit exactly the same growth. So all of that was talking about function growth for general functions. But of course, what we have is we can actually apply this stuff to algorithms and talk about the concept of algorithm complexity. So when we're talking about algorithm complexity, what we're saying is we're looking at basically the number of operations, how the number of operations it takes in order to solve a specific problem using an algorithm. We're looking at how the number of operations grows as the size of the input also grows. So we'll look at this t of n function right here. We say that t of n is a function of the time an algorithm takes to complete based on the number of operations as a factor of the size of the input, which is n. So t of n for some algorithm might say, okay, well, if you pass, if, if we have some algorithm that is taking in a uh, input of size 1 million, so say we're doing max element over a sequence of 1 million elements, how many operations is it going to take for um, that algorithm to complete and give us an answer? Or how many will it take for linear search? Or how many will it take for merge or merge sort? How many operations will it take for n equals 1 million versus n equals 1 billion versus n equals 1 trillion and so on and so on? The problem is, is that we don't really care about some specific number of operations because in the long run, minor differences, well, okay, let's put it this way. I might have one way of writing an algorithm for a problem, and you might have another way of writing an algorithm for a problem. Maybe your way, you can write a linear search in a way that takes less actual operations than I can. But we don't really care about so much about the minute differences in operations between your method and my method. What we really care about is, does your, it, it, is your, um, as we increase the input from 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 100,000 and so on and so on and so on, does your algorithm, how, how, do, how does the number of operations your algorithm will perform, how does that value sort of increase as, the, as we increase the size of the input versus how will mine increase? And if basically, if we can say that both of our uh, both of our functions are here, both of our t events for our algorithms, if they basically are bounded by the same functions, if they have the same big O, then we don't care so much about the actual number of operations. We more care about how the, basically, the big picture, how the size of the output increases. So really, um, if we say that our two functions are bounded by the same function, um, if we say that our our functions are both big O of the same function, and also, you know, and in algorithms class, you also talk about uh, if our algorithms are also big omega, meaning that if our algorithms are big theta of the same function, then they practically are pretty similar and practically interchangeable. Uh, if we If we try to talk about specifically a number of operations, it also gets confusing because different... Once we start trying to apply this to computers, then different computers have different operating systems which and uh, different hardwares, architectures, all that kind of stuff, which can further confuse the number of actual operations that it does because different architectures and different operating systems do different numbers of operations for even the silliest of things. It gets weird. 
So we don't care so much about the actual number of operations. We more care about the big O notation of our T of N right here. Regardless, we'll get more towards that. So T, we say that our T function takes in a positive integer and gives us out a positive integer. It takes in a positive integer size, so maybe our size is the number of elements in a sequence. Most likely, we're going to have a non-zero, uh, non-negative sequence. So, you know, a sequence with a positive number of elements in it. And the number of instructions will certainly be at least one, because even if even with uh, the algorithms that are designed to take in a uh, input of zero, uh, of size zero, uh, it will certainly have to do at least one operation to check that the input is size zero and then return something. So we say that normally our t functions, the the function, our timing functions basically go from the positive integers to the positive integers. In this class, uh, we are focusing on recursive algorithms, so our t's will actually be recursive. So the time it takes for our algorithm to complete uh, on a size on an input size of n is we can basically model this as a times t of m plus o of g of x. And breaking this down, uh, a times t of m is going to be all the time that's dedicated to finishing all recursive calls from our t of n call. So a is going to be the number of time the number of times that our current level actually recurses. So in linear search and in max element, we recurse only once per each level. Let me uh, pull, let me grab those algorithms again. All the algorithms. Let me see. I don't have max element on me, but I do have linear search. And when we're looking at an input of size n, we recurse exactly once on this one called a linear search right here. However, when we look at merge sort, merge sort recurses twice. Once on the call to the first half of the algorithm uh, of the list, and once on the call to the, on that on the call applying to the second half of the list. So in linear search's case, a would be one, and in merge sort's case, case a would be two. M is going to refer to the size of the input uh, given to each recursion. So in linear search, m is equal to n minus 1. In merge sort, m is equal to n divided by 2, uh, give or take, you know, rounding up or down, depending on which recursive call it is. And then O of g of x is basically all of the other work that happens in our call on n that is not part of the recursion at all. So let's take a look first at linear search again, and we're going to build our recursive t function for linear search. So what I have right here, uh, whoops, where is it? Here it is. This is the linear search algorithm again. This is the recursive call. So everything that happens from when we re from when we call linear search to when we return the value of this linear search from a2 to a sub n, is this all happens under the 1 times t to the n minus 1 part. And the rest of this, everything else in here, is going to determine the O of G of X. So the upper bound on the number of operations it will take for us to go from the start of this algorithm to the recursive call. So every time we go in here, uh, let's take a look at when N is greater than 1. When N is greater than 1, it will, take us, it will always take us one check to see if N is equal to 0. Then it will be one check to see, or sorry, a constant number of checks, I should say, a constant number of checks to see if n equals zero. In this case, I think it is something like one or two. Uh, in this case, it will be one or two checks to see if x is equal to a sub one. And then when both of these fail, uh, it just the algorithm just proceeds there. So no matter what n is, supposing that um, we're not talking about one of the base cases. It will always take us two checks to go from here to the next linear, uh, to, to the next linear, uh, blah, to the next recursive call on linear search. If there is a base case, if, if we're looking at the n equals zero base case, then it's one check here and one operation to go to the to return false. If we're looking at the x equals a sub one, then it's one check here, one check here, and one operation to return true. 
So no matter what, we basically have a constant number of operations. So when we have a constant number of operations, let's say the number of operations it takes us to go to basically go from the top of the algorithm to the next recursion, if we call that, uh, let's call it the letter D. This is basically going to be O of 1, where G of X is basically equal to 1. And we can see this by saying that uh, C equals D and K equals 0. Um, then D, absolute value of D, which will be positive, is less than or equal to D times the absolute value of 1, which, you know, D is less than or equal to D is true. So we say that the amount of work here needed, if it takes us basically a constant number of operations, then the amount of work here is O of 1. Or, yeah, it's, it's constant. So linear search, we're going to combine all this together. Linear search T of n is equal to 1 times T of n minus 1 plus O of 1. We can simplify this to just T of n minus 1 plus O of 1. Let's take a look now at merge, uh, the actual merge algorithm here. This is it for reference. Um, now let's see. There are two places where merge can recurse in here, but only one of these will be chosen at a time. There won't be any way for us to, to go down both of these recursions at the same time. If we're recursing, we're either recursing down here because a sub 1 is less than b sub 1, or we're recursing down here because b sub 1 is greater than or equal to a sub 1. So the merge, the uh, recursion is always on t of, in this case, it's m plus l minus 1, where m plus l is sort of the total size of the input. Since we have an input of size l up here and an input of size m. Uh, so in this case, uh, rather than doing t of n, we're actually looking at t of m plus l, where we can say that n is actually equal to m plus l if we, if we want to. So then this would just be t of n minus 1 in that case. Now, in order, to go to, in order to get to the recursion, what we can do is we can notice that no matter what n or no matter what m plus l is, there basically is, at the worst case, one, two, three checks in order to get to our recursion here, and then a fourth operation to actually, actually, well, this would be four, five, I would say four, five, maybe six, if you count the creation of the new sequence as an operation. Again, this is why we don't really care about operations so much because it gets kind of fuzzy on what is an operation, what isn't an operation, or how many, how many operations something is. But we can say pretty confidently that this is a constant number of operations in the worst case. In the best case, L is equal to zero and we just return B, which is two operations. Second best case, L is not zero, but M equals zero. And then we return A, which is three operations. And then in here, it would be uh, somewhere in the lines of four to six, but that's always four to six, no matter what M plus L is. So we would say that all the work that is not part of the recursion, we would say that all of this is O of one, or it's a constant amount of work, no matter what N is, it will always be anywhere from two to six operations. So coming back here, we would say that t of n equals 1 times t to the n minus 1, uh, t of n minus 1 plus o of 1. Or again, we have another t of n minus 1 plus o of 1 operation. And then finally, let's take a look at merge sort. So merge sort right here. Now we get something different with our recursion. We recurse twice, and the size of the recursion is about n over 2. I'm just going to put n over 2 here. In this case, it's uh, the ceiling of n over 2, or n over 2 rounded up. In this case, it's n over 2 rounded down. On average, that's just n over 2. So we'll say that two times, uh, we'll say that the recursion is 2 times n over 2. Now, how much of merge sorts work is done outside of the recursion? Well, this is a constant number of operations. We would say probably three at most. 
This would be one operation checking if n is less than one or less than or equal to one. That's about one operation. And then otherwise, what we're doing is we take the outputs of here and we pass them into merge. So the big O for merge is going to be O of T submerge of N plus one. Or really since uh, this is going to be much larger than this, we can just basically simplify this to O of T submerge of N. Now here's the problem. We want to figure out what the big O notation is for T, for uh, merges T function in order to really fully flesh out what this is. So we can't actually talk about what merge sorts t of n is until we actually figure out what merges o of n is. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how to close t of n. And notice that t of n is, you know, t of n is a recursive sequence. So we're actually going to close it in a way that's similar to, um, in a way that's similar to closing functions, the, cl the closing functions in the way that we've done before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce something called the tree method. So we're going to look at merge sort. Uh, so merge, sorry, we're going to look at merge first. So merge uh, t of n is equal to t of n over 2 plus o of n. Now here's the way that I like to do this, uh, we call this the tree method, usually in the computer science department, is on the left side, I'm basically going to sort of, well, I'll draw out the diagram. So right here, I'm going to draw a node. Basically, I'm drawing a tree, or you know, sort of a very fancy graph. Uh, I'm going to draw a node and label it with n. This is going to represent the size of our problem when it is n, or basically, uh, yeah, this is going to represent us applying merge to our problem when the total input size is n. And what we're going to notice is that since we have t of n equals t of n over two plus o of n, what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to write the amount of work that merge does at level n. Words. Uh, words are hard. Basically, when we have an input of size n, other than the recursion, the recursion will handle down here. Other than the recursion, at level n, merge does an O of n amount of work. Oh, sorry. That should be O of 1. My apologies. This, should, this is O of 1. An O of 1 amount of work. And then what merge does... Oh. My apologies, I totally wrote down the wrong one. Uh, merge is going to be t of n equals t of n minus 1 plus o of 1. I'm so sorry about that. But anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out n. n is our initial starting point. Uh, uh, sorry, starting problem size. We're going to do o of 1 here. And then we'll handle the recursion by going down a level in our sort of tree. This will be at level n minus 1. This is the next recursion here. And merge at the with an input size of, o of, of uh, n minus 1 does an O of 1 amount of work, does a constant amount of work. And then one more, we'll continue this down to n minus 2. And with an input size of n minus 2, merge does an o, a constant amount of work and then passes that recursion on to uh, merge of an input size of n minus 3, and so on. So then merge recurses down to an input size of n minus 3, n minus 4, n minus 5, n minus 6, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way until it reaches an input size of 1, like so. In the worst case, sorry, I, I should say that in the worst case, it reaches an input size of 1. Really, merge could end anywhere in this area, but in the worst case, uh, let's say everything in A is exhausted and B has one element left. So we've combined everything except for the last two elements, or one element in A and one element in B. We choose the element of A. It's just, let's say without lots of generality, we choose the element of A to be less. And then we recurse down on an empty list for A and a single element in B. And we say, okay, now we're done. And then we start combining everything back uh, recursively again.
Um, so in the worst case scenario, merge is finally going to finish when there's exactly one element left between A and B, and it will do a constant amount of work there. I'll draw a line here. So all in all, in the worst case, merge is going to basically perform n total recursions. And on each recursion, it's going to do a constant amount of work. So what we can say is that, well, it's doing a constant amount of work n times. So the total amount of work is going to be O of 1 plus O of 1 plus O of 1 plus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, plus O of 1. All this is going to be multiplied. Uh, is Basically, we're doing a constant amount of work n times, which is basically O of n times 1, which is O of n. So the entirety of merge is O of n. Uh, merge does an O of n amount of operations when it has an input size of n. Um, imagine this might be a little bit confusing, so we'll go through some more examples, of course. But what this means here is we can come back over here to merge as t of n, and we'll say that merge is equal to O of n. Merge is an O of n algorithm. Or we would say that merge is linear in this case. Um, more detail on that in a little bit. So, the next thing we can look at, actually, here, let's come back here. Because now that we know that merge is O of n, we can come back here and say that, okay, well, when we're talking about merge sort, the amount of work that merge does is actually a factor in how much work merge sort does. So now, basically, this is equal to O of n. So merge does an O of n amount of work. So when merge sort takes in an input of size n, it's going to do an O of n amount of work in order to handle this merge, plus the amount of work it needs to do to recurse twice on a list size of n over 2. So let's take a look at that. Merge sort is basically going to be 2 times t of n over 2 plus O of n. I'll bring this up to the camera more so it's a little bit easier to see. So now that we have this, we can actually use the tree method to see how merge sorts uh, algorithmic complexity is. So let's do that here. So for merge sort, we have t of n equals 2 times t of n over 2 plus o of n. So let's set up the tree method. We'll start with a problem size of n, like so, and at n and with the problem size of n, merge sort does O of n amount of work plus the recursion. So it does two recursive calls, each recursive call taking in a size of n over 2 and n over 2. And each recursive call does uh, 2 times O of not n, but n over 2 amount of work because you're basically merging together n over 2 number of elements. So then you have 2 times n over O of n over 2 amount of work, which uh, we can simplify down to, a con to an O of n amount of work, because we're merging n over 2 items and here, and we're merging n over 2 items here, so the total amount of items being merged is n. And then at each level here, it recurses down to n over 4, n over 4, n over 4, and n over 4, like so. At this level, it's going to do 4 times O of n over 4, which is equal to O of n. And so on, and so on, and so on. Until finally, we're going to get a whole bunch of O of 1s down here. At the worst case, uh, well, actually, yeah, we'll get a whole bunch of O of 1. So 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. The problem is now is we need to figure out how much work is being done. Well, actually, I, w I wouldn't say that a ton of work, I wouldn't say that this problem is too hard to figure out because 
In this case, it's we don't need to do any merging, but it's a constant amount of work. Well, let's come back to uh, merge sort. If I can find merge sort again, I forget where it went. Uh, oh, somewhere. Ah, here it is. When n equals 1, when we're looking at merge sort on size n, uh, then basically we're doing a constant amount of work. And then after that constant amount of work, we're just returning the list. So that's also a constant amount of work. So basically we have O of 1 amount of work for each one of these nodes times the n nodes that a constant amount of work is being done on. And that's going to end up being O of n amount of work in total still. And then the last thing we need to figure out is how many times does, uh, how many total levels is this tree? First it's n, then it's n over 2, then it's n over 4, then etc, etc, etc. We can think of this as n over 2 to the, well, okay, let me put it like this. Um, n is going to be equal to n over 1, which is equal to n over 2 to the 0. We can write n over 2 as n over 2 to the first. n over 4 is n over 2 squared. n over 8, which would be the next recursion, is n over 2 cubed, and so on and so on. 1, the final element here, 1 is going to be equal to n divided by n, and then we'll apply some rules of uh, logarithms and exponents here to say that this is equal to n divided by 2 to the log base 2 of n. So basically, when we've recursed 0 times, the size of the input is n over 2 to the 0. When we've recursed to, like, down to the first level, the size of the input at each node is n over 2 to the first. When we recurse uh, down two levels, the size of the input is n over 2 squared, which is n over 4, etc., etc. And when we recurse down log base 2 of n levels, then the size of the input is n divided by 2 to the log base 2 of n, which equals 1. So we can apply, you can use this logic to basically say that there are log base 2 of n levels here. So the Basically, what we're ha what we're doing is we're doing an O of n amount of work log base 2 of n times. So we have log base 2 of n times O of n amount of work, and we say that this is O of n times log base 2 of n, uh, which you wouldn't say that this is O of n, or you wouldn't say that this is O of n squared. This is actually in a category of its own, called usually called linear rhythmic or something like that. And in order to really make sense of that, let's talk about uh, sort of what big O, sort of what a uh, function, what big O sizes we consider to be more complex than other big O sizes. So we say that O of one functions, constant functions, the functions that take a constant amount of time, no matter what their input size are, are like the best. They're the least complex type of function. They're super cool. Then we say that O of n linear functions are the next best. You know, if we can't get O of 1, at least it's nice for us to have an algorithm that only takes as uh, about as many times to complete as the size of its input. So this is where merge lies. This is also where linear search and max element lie, um, which you can see basically by applying, uh, by applying uh, this tree method to linear search or max element, which have the exact same T of, the exact same T of n. And then writing just over this is O of n log n. I'm going to leave this as O of n log n rather than saying anything like log base 2 of n, log base 10 of n, natural log of n, etc., etc. Really, it doesn't matter what base we use here. And the reason why it comes, the proof of this basically comes down to the change of base formula. Um, I'm happy to show this in class if any of you want, but given that I don't have a ton of time, I can't really show this off right now. Then O of n log n is less complex than O of n squared, which is less complex than O of n squared log n, which is less complex than n cubed, which is less complex than O of n cubed log n, etc., etc., etc. 
This works for all polynomials. And then after every single polynomial comes the exponential function. So this is less than O of B to the N for some B being greater than or equal to one. So B to the N is much more complex than any polynomial and any polynomial times a log. Uh, yeah, any polynomial times a log. O V to the N is less complex than O of N factorial. Excuse me, N factorial is rough, uh, basically, because you're doing N factorial on a size, input size of N. That'd be doing something like, a, you know, we're somewhere in the realm of, say, 100 million factorial calculations on an input size of 100 million. It's ugly. You don't, you don't like to see it. Um, and then finally, this is all less than something like O of N to the nth power, which is horrible. And there might even be worse ones out there, but O of n to the nth power. I haven't even seen something that is this bad, I'll be honest. Um, it's rough. Actually, maybe some like really inefficient sorting is like this bad, but I can't even think of it at the moment, I'll be honest. Um, it's not good. But yeah, so this is what I mean in terms of less complex. So... We could say that O of n log n is O of n squared, but it's more convenient for us to say that this is O of n log n because it's a little more accurate to merge sort, I suppose. So putting this all together, let me see if I can find the page I was working on again because now all of my notes are a mess. Um, but, you know, that is just how life is these days is a little bit of a mess. Let's be real. Merge sort is O of N log N. Surely there must be an easier way, you might be asking. And yes, there is an easier way. It's called the master theorem. But don't let the name fool you, because for something called the master theorem, it really isn't as cool as it sounds. Um, I don't know if any of you had or currently have a Doctor Who phase. Uh, no judgment, because I definitely used to be way into Doctor Who in high school. I understand the draw. But I like to think of the Master Theorem, for those of you who have watched it, I like to think of the Master Theorem as the Master himself. Someone who's like, oh, I'm super cool. I am the Master. I am this big baddie who's all-powerful and all that kind of stuff. And then he gets defeated by like the stupidest shit. I think, honestly, I haven't even seen the new seasons. I think the Master ends up regenerating as a girl at some point. Honestly, I, I kind of stopped watching after, uh, I think in like 2016 is when I stopped watching. So I'm not familiar with stuff after that. But um, basically, the Master Theorem, it sounds super cool. It sounds like you could use it all the time. You can't use it all the time. Uh, you can only use it uh, for recursive T functions in the form of t of n equals a times t of n over b plus o of n to the d. And if you have a recursive form like this, then you can use this piecewise function to figure out what t of n is. So t of n will equal o of n to the d if d is greater than log base b of a. t of n will equal o, to, uh, o of n to the d log n if d equals log base b of a. And t of n will equal O of n to the power of log base b of a if d is less than log base b of a. The proof of this, I'm not going to show you. It is ugly. Um, so yeah. But let's check if we can use the master theorem on any of the, any of the uh, functions that we've talked about so far. So let's take a look at... Uh, Merge at uh, merges. So let's take a look at t of n equals t of n minus 1 plus o of 1. We can't use the master theorem here because we have t of n minus 1 here, not t of n divided by something. So can't use master theorem. You have to use the tree method. However, if we look at merge sorts at 
t of n equals 2 times t of n divided by 2 plus o of n. We actually can use it here. So we'll note that in this case, a will be equal to 2, b will also be equal to 2, and n, because this is n to the first power, oh, sorry, not n, uh, d, in this case, d is equal to 1, since this is n to the first power here. So then what we'll do is we'll check log base b of a is equal to log base uh, 2 of 2, which is equal to 1, which is actually exactly equal to d. So because log base b of a equals d, we're going to take this option right here. So we'll say that t of n is equal to n to the d times log n, which in this case is uh, n to the first log n, n log n, which is exactly what we got in the tree method for merge sort. Right here, n log n. So the master theorem is a really great way of uh, you know checking your work for the for the tree method. I would say prioritize learning the tree method first and foremost because the tree method um, works for any recursive t of n. So and what what we'll do is we'll actually in class we'll do a lot of practice of the tree method uh, for a whole bunch of equations. But definitely practice the tree method. If you fill up for it, you can memorize the master theorem and use the master theorem instead of the tree method. However, you should, well, first off, you should show your work. You should always show your work for the master theorem. So do basically what I did here, talk about what A, B, and D are, and then show the calculations that show, okay, well, this is why we have to, we, we can use the master theorem to say that this is true. You run the risk of potentially losing a lot more points with the master theorem than if you did with the tree method, because the tree method, it's a lot easier to get partial credit. The master theorem is like, oh, well, you misremembered the master theorem, so now you're losing like a whole bunch of points on the final. So definitely practice the tree method first and foremost, but you are welcome to use the master theorem. I'm not guaranteeing that you can use the master theorem on the final. I'm not guaranteeing that you cannot use the master theorem on the final. Either is possible. All right, so that's my rant about the Master Theorem. Actually, that's, uh, honestly, that's all I have to talk about for complexity, I believe. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there, but honestly, if you take, uh, if you take algorithms, you know, you'll cover all that other stuff anyway. So really, this is about everything you need to know, actually, for all of CSC 348. So, yeah. I really appreciate you all sticking through with me. I know this has been a really rough quarter. Actually, I'm going to switch it over to my face cam. This is completely impromptu, by the way. I did not plan this at all. Um, let's see. Let me switch it over to the face cam. Hello, this is me. It is uh, currently 1.38 a.m. on June 1st. Uh, happy Pride Month to everyone who uh, celebrate, who, who is, you know, LGBT. If you're not LGBT, please wish the LGBT people in your life a happy Pride Month. Um, but yeah, it is currently 1.38 on June 1st. I am very sleepy and very caffeine addicted at this point in the quarter. But I want to thank you all for sticking with me through this. I know it's been rough. It's been rough on you. It's been rough on me. Uh, I wish I could have been more there for you. I wish I could have been more on top of things like grading and not posting lectures at like midnight to 3 a.m. But, you know, this quarter has hit us all pretty hard. So I want to thank you for, I guess, giving me a chance when you signed up for this class. Thank you for sticking with me, for giving me your feedback, and for being patient with everything. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate y'all. I hope y'all are doing as well as possible. And I hope that this class has um, has helped you in any way, uh, that, that, that you're able to take something good from this class. And hopefully you can apply it no matter what your major is, no matter what you end up doing after college, I hope you're able to apply this in some way. If nothing else, I hope that being practiced in logic and, you know, thinking through the arguments that people present in determining, hey, is this 
a sound argument or are there pieces that need to be filled in? Is there evidence that's missing or is there evidence that contradicts that kind of stuff? That's a very valuable skill. So it has this has a lot of real life applications outside of just programming and stuff like that. It has a lot of applications for making sure that you're not getting uh, you know fooled or tricked or things like that. It, it's good for making a case why say maybe I don't know you should be promoted or something like that or why hey maybe it's not a cool idea for I don't know for me to get like half of a cookie when my sibling gets like a full cookie my younger sibling gets a full cookie or something like that uh hashtag older sibling problems or whatever I don't know I hope you all got something useful out of this even though the quarter was rough and yeah I'll be wishing the best for all of you in the future. Thank you all so much for being in the class. Thank you all so much for being here in general. And I'm proud of you for making it through this quarter. All right. Have a nice day, y'all. I'll see you all in class.